Okay, hi everybody. You know what, before I get started, I noticed there's this new button on Skype in the upgrade. It's called Dimensional Shift. Let me press it and see what happens. Huh, that's weird. Nothing. All right, anyway, we'll start the podcast. I'm Paul McCartney, and this is my good buddy, John Lennon, and we're here to take a, a big look at the incredible music of Vinnie Caggiano and James Corbett. <laughs> what an alternate universe that would be, huh? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Hi, James. How you doing? I'm cold. It's cold yes. over here. Can you give us some of that California sunshine? Yeah, I wish I could, man. You know, I, I have plenty of reason to feel guilty. I mean, when you look at a weather map of, of the United States, everything's buried in snow except for Southern California and Florida on the other end. I, I always feel guilty this time of year. Uh, but you know, we have we have enough problems where it kind of. I was going to say, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll take cold Japan over sunny California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No offense. It's crazy here, but you know we'll get lucky if uh, Newsom, Newsom gets recalled. That could happen. So we'll see what happens. And then you but can get the governor. Isn't that how you got the governor in the first place? That's right. <laughs> Which actor will it be this time? <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Well, I heard there's a tech billionaire that wants to take the governor's seat, which would be even worse. Um, so we have to see what happens. Let's not clutter up this conversation with that garbage. Yeah, I agree. Let's do music and let's talk <laughs> about the Beatles, right? Yes. And today, James, it's two of us doing two of us. Indeed. How appropriate. Should I get yes, my on indeed. my guitar? <laughs> Nothing, no one wants. Uh, no one wants to hear that. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, speaking of, you know uh, that pro we've talked about. I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast, but I've had this incredible problem with the introduction for years and years and years with the introduction of "I Want to Hold Your Hand." I heard the the first chord on the wrong beat, and I've been hearing it wrong all my life. I recently corrected the problem. Uh, then, of course, there's the problem of the intro to Drive My Car, which nobody understands, right? And uh, with two of us, believe it or not, I had the same problem, but it rectified quickly. As the, on the very first time I heard this, this sounded like a pickup. Mm -hmm. One, yeah, two, exactly. three, yeah. four, one, two, yeah, three, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then when the everything kicks in, you hear that like, everything falls on the one, and then you kind of reorganize it to one, two, three, four. But you're you're exactly right about that because still every time I hear it, I'm not consciously thinking about that. But it yeah, it feels like a pickup, doesn't it? Yeah, it feels like that indeed. So yeah, that that was uh, that I distinctly remember that the very first time I heard that song, my my brain was turned around for a second when I heard the actual downbeat so and uh why don't we talk a little bit about the atmosphere of things and our favorite beatles record let it be i say that with a snide edge it's my least favorite beatles record i don't think it's your least favorite but it's down there it's not yeah. up there but it's not i'm gonna be the defender in this conversation i guess just to have mm -hmm. a little bit of back and forth on it but yeah okay. it's not a, it's not that bad it's not that bad Mm -hmm. Then again, here's here's my perspective on this. I mean, I, 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 I know this, but I don't consciously think about it. But really, almost my whole life, for 25 years or so, I really haven't listened to Let It Be. I've listened to Let It Be Naked, ah, which is a yeah. different album, really. I yes, mean, yes. yeah. And so, so that is what I think of when I think of this album, which not only just production-wise, obviously takes out some of the specterization, but also... I mean, it has Get Back, it has Don't Let Me Down. Like, I can't think of this album without those songs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you mentioned Let It Be Naked because uh, I had picked up on that record, you know, when it came out, and uh, suddenly I had a pleasant experience of Let It Be. I, I suddenly liked it. Uh, this was in my notes for later on, but I'll say it now. 
Phil Spector lacked the finesse that uh, George Martin had. He simply did not. He was not a producer for the Beatles. It's that simple. What he did to Long and Winding Road is unforgivable. It's really like, what? With the with the choruses and the arc, like, what are you doing, dude? Like you're, it's like putting, I don't know, too much sugar in your cereal or something. It's just way insane, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he turned out to be not a nice guy, so bad energy right off the bat. Let it be wasn't great energy, you know, even, you know, they were under bad conditions. Well, we'll see, because they're going to release the updated version of the Let It Be movie, the Get It, Get Back, whatever, um, yeah. by Lord of the Rings guy, what's his name, Peter Jackson. So we'll see. Peter Jackson, yeah. And maybe yeah. it'll be a different uh, take on it. And it, what from what they've shown so far, it definitely looks different than, I think, a lot of people's expectations. Speaking of which, okay, so let's set the table in. January 1969, uh, the Beatles have this idea they're going to get back to their roots, they're going to do a raw, live, stripped-down album, just them playing live takes, just record it. Here's what we'll do. We'll spend a month rehearsing it in the Twickenham Film Studios in front of the cameras, and then we'll go out and do a concert, and they were talking about going to the Greek Parthenon or whatever, just all these crazy ideas. Eventually, it's like, oh, let's just go to the roof. Okay. And uh, that's kind of, that's kind of yeah, that's kind of the project in a nutshell. Like, oh, let's do this great. Oh, well, let's just, let's just get it done. And so um, January, they spend January rehearsing it. Uh, they eventually move from Twickenham to the Apple Studios, I believe, which were a mess because of Magic Alex and all the craziness going on there. But um, they rehearse it a bit. They get to the point January 30th, they do the rooftop concert. January 31st, they go back in to record some of the songs that they didn't record on the rooftop that ended up on the album, like Two of Us. And uh, the, although the idea was to have minimal production stuff on top, a lot of the album ends up being studio trickery. Um, that sounds like, oh, is this the live take? Well, no, not really. Uh, Two of Us is one of the only ones that really is pretty much what it says on the tin. It's them in the room, live take. Um, but most of the others have tr trickery of one sort or another, combining takes and doing other stuff. Um, I will at this point point people to, if they are interested in the production of Let It Be, uh, there's a YouTube, unfortunately, channel called Produce Like a Pro that had the Beatles' Let It Be album breakdown with Jeremy Jerry Hammock where this guy and Jerry Hammock go through and talk about track by track and go through everything. So if you want to know what guitar was used and what microphone and all of that stuff on every single track and, you know, what take of it and what mixing take and all of this, all of that's in there. The surprising thing about that, that, that particular video that I'll, I'll send to you so you can put in the show notes if you want. Please, yeah, uh, the, yeah. the surprising thing was, one, it was both of their favorite Beatles albums. <laughs> And secondly, <laughs> um, at some point during the conversation, they're talking about, which song are they talking about? And they note that John is playing around doing a bar of four and a bar of three, and I think there's a bar of five in there. And anyway, so um, Jerry remarks, oh yes, this is a sign. Uh, John was overall a more sophisticated songwriter than Paul and would often play around with time. And, and when he said that, it was fascinating because I was sitting there watching this and I went, that's not true. <laughs> How can you say that? That's that's just not true. And me being a lifelong John fan, Paul, oh, that's that silly granny music. I am now flipping around to the point where it's like, are you talking smack about Paul? Really? More sophisticated songwriter? That's ridiculous. So that was yeah, a revelation I mean, for me. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you know, if you, if you go to the White Album and look at, uh, Paul could have easily written Bungalow Bill, but John could have never written Martha My Dear. It's just that simple. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, Paul was a more sophisticated yeah. musician. Yeah. Yeah, I think Not so. that I like uh, John had an incredible too. intuitive sense. He had incredible emotional power. Um, but sophisticated is not the word I would use to <laughs> describe his songwriting. Yeah, he. Uh, there's a lot of serendipity to his writing. Um, mm. He just kind of landed upon things that were perfect. He and, obviously uh, had an ear. He obviously yeah. knew what sounded good. But yeah, I, he yeah. couldn't, I'm sure he could not explain it. I think, you know, part of it was John was 
John was not mechanically inclined, you know, like he didn't understand how the studio worked or equalizers or anything like that. He had no idea, couldn't figure it out. And Paul, I think, did have that sense. So when you think of music theory as mechanics, you know, uh, John just didn't have that music theory sense in his bloodstream. He granted he wrote brilliant stuff, but he didn't have that kind of indwelling sense of how things work in music that Paul had. You know, I believe that. Before we get off the sort of general background stuff, I will also point people to, unfortunately, another YouTube channel. People stop making YouTube channels. But there's one called Pop Goes the 60s that's been doing some really interesting in-depth explorations of, um, like, Beatles outtakes and things and bootlegs. And this guy uh, was going through the Nagra reels recently for a couple of different uh, videos he was doing. One on the argument between John and... And, uh, between Paul and George. I'll play anything right. you like, or I won't play anything at all. Which, yeah. of course, is probably one of the things that people stick out from these sessions. Oh, you know, it was right. falling yeah. apart. They yeah. were clearly breaking yeah. up. And then uh, he also did one on All Things Must Pass was not rejected by the Beatles. And he, uh, he's doing some great deep dives into actually listening to the actual tapes of the recordings as opposed to what people are writing about, oh, you know, they said this. or No, you can actually listen to them having their, their discussions. And it really gave me a very different perspective on what was going wow. on there. And I had a very visceral sense of how shortchanged Paul has been by history in that he was the bossy one. He was telling everyone was like, oh, screw you, Paul. I just want to. But no, listen to the tapes and you really get a sense, a visceral sense. Paul was really trying to be diplomatic and George was being very passive aggressive. And you get a, I, I think you get a very different perspective when you're listening to it. So that I, I would wow. recommend people listen to that. I wouldn't be one bit surprised. Like when you watch Beatles anthology, uh, when there's one moment where George mentions they're talking, he's talking about John and Paul's writing and he, and he, he refers to, the hits and he says it in such a uh kind of snide way like as if to demean them for writing great songs yeah. but to, right yeah but i think it really was sour grapes you know honestly i can un grapes. understand a budding songwriter being in a band with lennon and mccartney you know you can't blame him for having a bit of sour grapes about that. <laughs> and hey, he produced, he ended up producing songs that I think were at the Lennon McCartney level, something. And uh, here comes the sun. Incredible. Amazing. He deserved yeah. to be on a Beatles album. How many songwriters can say that? <laughs> but yeah, right, I get it. Right. He was, I'm sure, a little bit cynical about it. I think he was. Yeah. And uh, speaking of, uh, you know, giving Paul the time of day about all this, I have a question for you. Um, you said the Beatles had had the idea to film their rehearsals and do the live show and everything like that. I'm under the impression McCartney had the idea and he pushed John into it. I, that's I, my I mean, yeah. That's what has always been. As far as you know, but I, I, yeah, I don't know anything that would contradict that. But but I'll tell you what. Know. You know, I I would think that Paul was doing it to actually please John, because. Number one, they all like making movies. They always like making movies. They always had a good time doing that. But that aside, uh, John was getting more and more into this mood of, I just like rock and roll. I'm tired of this pop business. I want to do more rock and roll. I want to do more rock and roll. I think Paul was trying to appease John a little bit by saying, look, let's do that then. Yeah. Let's go back to the way we used to do it. Yeah, that fits into, I think, the the standard narrative. Paul was the one that was trying to keep the band together and let's let's keep doing something, guys. Yeah, and that, that's I'm sure there's something to that. Um, oh, there is something to it, yeah. But let's, let's take a look at uh, two of us in particular. That's the track we've selected for today. Day. Um, my other t uh, selection that uh, Vinny vetoed was uh, um, uh, I've Got a Feeling, which I wanted to do specifically because that uh, the ending where those two different melodies come together and they're both singing them on top of each other. I love that. I love that thing. And yet I have, I really, I've tried to rack my brains. How many songs do that in particular? Like singing two completely different melodies, bringing them, introducing them separately, then bring them together over top of each other. I can only think of one. And I've asked my hipster friends and everything, and they're like, oh, this song kind of does that, but not really. But anyway, I love that. And secondarily, I should also say, 
I like dig a pony. I know you don't. <laughs> but produce like that producer like a produce like a pro video I'm talking about. They they go into why that's such a great song. And uh I must say, if nothing else, that moment where Paul flubs the harmony on because and then Right, woo, right. Oh, that that moment is worth the price of admission for me. I love that little musical exchange that John and Paul have that shows they still they're still uh they it would be so amazing to watch them play together god i'm so looking forward to the get back movie i really am i just want to see that side of things um because it's kind of sad like that was you know the last movie the beatles left us and you know you don't want to have like a bad feeling about such a really positive band mostly that had such a positive effect no so exactly well we'll see so yeah. getting to two of us, um, I'm going to admit, I never knew whether this was a Lennon or a McCartney song. I kind of thought maybe they co-wrote it, but apparently this is Paul. This is Paul all the way. And in fact, I don't know if you read up on it, but uh, apparently this was originally more of a chunk and rocker. Uh, yeah. And Paul decided he, he said it was literally too chunky. And uh, one commentator uh, put it like they... They they went to the acoustic sound and went back to the Everly Brothers kind of harmonizing thing, which I would think is a really, really good, astute observation. Um, they were heavily influenced by those guys. And since they were doing the live thing and getting back to the early stuff, it seemed to all fit together well that way. Um, yeah, but uh, looking at two of us, um, the form, you know, let's start the wide picture, the form. Now, I, you know, I want to mention something. So we have our intro... The intro is extended when the band comes in and Paul hits uh, the iconic. Is right? that Paul? Is that? I was wondering about that, actually. Is that a bass or is that? Apparently no bass was used on this recording. All right. Then it was a, then it was a deep set. You know, actually, it could be George then. Cause he's I was listed thinking, as I think that's George. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a couple. Of, it, you know what? <laughs> When I get to a certain point later uh, about the song, I, I that will this little point might confirm that it's typically George, um, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so we have that the intro, like when the band kicks in, that's still part of the intro. Now, what you might think, and what people might think, is that all right. So we have. Someone might think, okay, that's the first verse, and the second one is da 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 da. It's actually, to me, this is one large verse, including the. All right, so in when we look at it like that, we have intro verse, then we have intro verse again, just like the original intro. We have the you know, and the coming in. Then we come to a bridge. Then we have a verse and a bridge and a verse and out. So the structure is A, A, B, A, B, A, and out, which is classic Beatles. Uh, you do a little bit longer in the beginning, but then you kind of shorten it later on. So we, know, we don't have another A, A, B. We have an A, B. And then the other A is the excuse to get out, the final A. So we have that. I want to talk a little bit about the lick. Um, if, if George actually wrote all these parts here, not bad at all. Um, this is part of uh, one of the, it's what I call sliding scale two in my lessons. Right? This sometimes this note is kind of the quintessential rock and roll move motion. You get stuff like yeah. Or, Why am I thinking oh blah dee blah da when you do that? What am I thinking? Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it too, actually, right off the bat. Um, a lot of rock and roll licks come off that root triad, and it's an arpeggio of the triad. 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, the Beatles and all the creativity, if you go to a big kind of variation on a theme there, but definitely based off that structure of the triad. The difference uh, in rock and roll, a lot of rock and roll at least, is because you have the blue note. Like a boogie kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or straight. It could be straight too. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah. Boogie uh, actually suggests a swing in the rhythm, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so we have that. Um, now, what's fun about this is that when we listen to it first, George, we're going to say George, does... switches up that and if you look at the actual fingering it's the same between two strings right so it's an easy switch up or, right so he exploited that a little bit um i think maybe i'll mention what i was uh what i was going to say earlier um so he manages, but uh, he manages to, to actually keep licks going throughout the song, even when we go to the bridge, all that stuff. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a moment when we get to the bridge. Um, but I just wanted to say this one thing. All you listeners out there, if you're real sticklers, uh, if you go to the Beatles, I'll, I'll post the one I listened to, but around the 315 timestamp, there's a mistake in the lick all right and you can barely hear it gets clipped but the thing instead instead of going uh, you hear this uh, uh, yeah you, you just hear here's the first one now that might not seem like a mistake but if you listen really closely there's the edge of a b note it's just slightly clipped at the 315 mark. And understand that back in, in those days, you had, uh, you know, on tape, you had this, he probably was a dedicated track. It was good enough, except for he might have hit a really bad clinker for that note. What they would do commonly in a studio is just simply go to that section, scrub the tape where the note is, and erase it. So he didn't, the engineer didn't want to get so close that he would clip the, the proper note before it. So I believe if you listen really closely, you could find that at the 315 mark. It's, a, it's always fun to find those little bits, you know. We've got to keep the uh, Beatles absolute hardcore super fanatics uh, slated. And, you know, it's hard to do that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I doubt many people actually heard that, uh, to be honest. I just, I, I'm a natural born editor. I could look at like a big page of text and my eyes will go to the grammatical error or the spelling. I don't know why. I'm just like that. The same with music. It, it's soon as I hear something funny, you know, I'm, so yeah, I picked up on it right away. So uh, now, uh, interesting thing, I, I don't know if you pick, uh, you read this in your research, but uh, someone, it was stated maybe in, I'm not sure if it was Wikipedia, Beatles Bible, that this song has more time signature changers than any other Beatles song, including Good Morning, Good Morning. Impossible. No. Well, I have a feeling these people overcomplicated it. Um, I'll tell you what happens is that we have a series of bars of 4-4. Four, four, uh, and then in a transition, there's a bar of 2-4. And then uh, when it goes to... Uh, That's in three four, okay. I, I think they overly complicated it by saying, "Oh, well, these are you know these are two four these are bar of four four, and then there's a few bars of two four, and then there's a bar of six four, and then there's three four. No, it's just like one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four. Wait, is that right? No, 
off. No, I have it wrong. There's a bar of two four in there somewhere. I just I forget where it is now. Um, <laughs> There it is, yeah. Uh, right there. Two. You hear yeah. that? Spending someone's so hard. Right. Ones is a bar of two. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a tiny little bar of two. You have a bunch of bars of four four. So really, this is like a Bert Bacharach thing. He used to do that, like a quick two four in in, in the place. Um, and then, yeah, um, so that's, it's funny about this, you know, that the, it doesn't sound waltzy when no, it comes not to at all. No. And I think part of it is because Ringo is just mm. pounding four on the floor. And when it's three on the floor, it still feels like it's pushing the four for some reason. But yeah, if, if you count it, uh, one, two, one. At the very end, you have a tag of two four, then it comes back. So that that's the time signature changes. Nothing as blatant and out there as "Good morning, good morning," as far as I'm concerned. You know, but and that's I because really, John was a more sophisticated songwriter, right? Of course, he was way more. Sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have that. The chords. Uh, if we look at the harmony and the chord movement, yada yada yada. Um, very simple, you know, very kind of folksy. And this move, super common move in a gazillion songs. I won't go into them all, you know, but the Paul Simon and so many people use this. Actually, uh, no, that's an F, but it's similar. Uh, for no one has it. Wasn't done on guitar, but the, you know, it's a real common guitar move. So, um, and what it is is C, C over B, which is basically a C chord with a B bass, which on its own, that's not a chord you sit around and vamp all day. Because it's got the evil minor ninth interval. Right? But moving through, dissonance to me, the analogy I give to my students, dissonance is like you're trying to cross a river and you have big stones, medium stones, and small stones. The small stones are very dissonant, so you jump off them real quick because you can't balance on a small stone. You have to jump off and use it as a jumping point to get to the next big stone. So basically, this is moving through. It doesn't hurt that much. It doesn't hurt at all, actually. So, but, you know, if he went. Now, that would be bad. That would be bad. Uh, so, yeah. You're not a music teacher, Vinny. You're a philosopher. <laughs> I'm both. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> quite true. I'm both. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm fascinated by the philosophy of music. Uh, Victor Wooten's book, uh, the great Victor Wooten, bass player who was with uh, uh, Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, just impossible musician. His entire book is nothing about music theory. It's just about how you approach playing a, an instrument, you know, the vibe of playing an instrument, the, the feeling behind it. I, I just love that part of it because it, that's never spoken about, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Do you know the so, name of that book? It's either called the music teacher, the music instructor, or the music tutor, I forget, That's something Wooten, like that. W O U T O N? Two O's, Wu, uh, Wu Ten, T E N. Yeah, Victor Wu. Look Wooten. that up. Yeah, it's a great book. You know, I, one thing I love is uh, I, let me just speak about this one moment I really love in the book. Uh, you know, it's like he sets it up like a mystic adventure, like he meets this mysterious music teacher that comes into his life and teaches him magical things about music. Uh, but um, in fact, one reviewer called him the Carlos Castaneda of music, you know. Uh, but in any case, there's one moment where uh, 
this music teacher talks about practicing and learning theory and all the hoops you have to jump through and you know Wooten kind of questions all that and he goes like you know it's just such a hard thing to be doing and the music teacher says to him well let me ask you something how did you learn how to talk and he well I didn't really get speaking lessons because I heard my parents talking when relatives or friends would come over I'd listen to them I try to imitate them and the teacher said to him look to be a great musician play with great musicians you know uh, I don't know if that's a million percent true. You do need the basis and the theory. You do need some, at least. But uh, and I'm sure Victor knows his theory in and out. But but still, I love that uh, this, this, because music is a language. It truly is a language. You know, that's the way I feel about it. It's not even metaphorically so. It's the mysterious language of emotions. So oh, there I go. All right. So. <laughs> that moment of philosophy was brought to you by. <laughs> yeah so um so the chord movement is is within the key of g g c c over b a minor one to five one to four and that's that it's very very simple um, yeah, um, it obviously sounds folksy for a number of reasons, including just the way they're singing the harmonies and stuff. But that chord movement, I think, is just pretty vanilla yeah, kind of chord movement yeah. you'd see in a folk song, right? Yeah, and their har harmony, their vocal harmony, is there's no nothing to write home about in terms of that either, because they're they're singing in parallel thirds, you know. So they're they're singing scale steps in parallel with each other. So no surprises there. What's interesting is this bridge that comes up. All right. Now, uh, we're going one, two, three, four. All right. So we go to the key of B flat suddenly, but yet it, it doesn't hurt. It, it's not like this shocking, shocking thing when we go to this key. And definitely there's a, there's a ringing in of newness and change, no doubt. But I believe the thing that makes it work, one of the things that makes it work is the space between the ending chord and waiting for the chord, next chord to come in. Now, this is what I've talked about numerous times. I had a student today talking about it, and he intellectually understood it, but he said, is there any way you could kind of kind of encapsulated in two sentences and that is the <laughs> parallel relative switch so what i said to him is you take two keys a minor third apart two major keys a minor third apart so in the key of g and we go a minor third is a step and a half that's my phone minor third is a step and a half so now i have the key of g and the key of b flat oh this looks familiar wait a second right it's in the song uh, what you do is you take the chords from both, you take all the chords from both keys and you basically mix and match. But the rule is that the lower key has to be the, the umbrella key, the master key through. And I, I can, I can do randomly take chords from the key of B flat and then end on G and there'll be this nice feeling. So here's G, I'll just do some stuff. As soon as you hear that, it's like, ah, oh, there's this feeling of having been released from something, right? Uh, I always say the sun shines. It's like the sh sun shining through the clouds and, you know, this happy feeling. So we have this in the song, the parallel relative switch. And uh, I won't go into the mechanics of the parallel relative switch. What I just said in two sentences was good enough. So... Uh, because I've discussed it over and over Yeah, we again. have talked about it in this series before. I just don't remember. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but just, that's enough to know. It's like, I have the key of G, that's going to be my umbrella key, and I have the sub-major, the major key, that's the sub-key working with this. Uh, a minor third away. Uh, I could tell you why it works, but again, I'd be getting into the mechanics of it and everything else. Why are people calling me in the middle of a podcast? Don't they know? Okay, so 
<laughs> All right. So, um, so let's talk what happens. Uh, let's talk about what happens there. You And I certainly understand how it goes back because D7 is the 5 7 of. The right. Line, which would be G. So if we look at the key of B flat, this is the first chord of the key, B flat. The third chord of the key is D minor, three steps up. Then it goes to the sixth chord. Then to take us back to G, he takes the two chord of G now. Like we're not, now we're going to a chord that is not in the key of B flat. Now, does this at all sound familiar? Yes. Uh, the first three chords sounded like help. Right. Yeah, first three chords of help. Good. Yeah. Uh, the the second part uh, definitely sounds reminiscent, but I don't remember. I'm actually talking about this part. Uh, yep, yeah, 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 I know, I know. Right? It's I, if I fell, of course. If I fell. R the oh, ending of the five. intro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not quite what I was pointing to. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because that's a half step modulation and god knows it's so brilliant it's so brilliant but that's not what i'm pointing to okay <laughs> yesterday uh, was such an easy game to play now here's the thing though he's not he's coming from a g minor that yesterday thing and this also happens in uh here there and everywhere i believe yeah yeah you know, this move happens in here, there, and everywhere. You go, here's a one chord of the key, right? We're in B flat. Now, let's forget the key of G for a moment, all right? All right. So, I'm going, I'm going from B flat to a relative minor, a G minor, right? I'm, I'm trying to get there. So, now... Now, in the key of G, what they call the key of G minor, there's only one example of the three types of minor scale, natural minor, harmonic minor, and melodic minor. Turns out that in melodic minor, the two chord, now, in natural minor and harmonic minor, the two chord is diminished. It's a diminished chord. It's an unstable chord. But in uh, melodic minor, the two chord is a full out minor triad. So, right, so we get yesterday, love was such an easy game. To so we're using the melodic minor to get to this relative minor chord of the key of B, uh, of B flat. It's, it, the A minor does not belong to this key of B flat. It totally does not, but it works so beautifully. Because it's not, remember I spoke to you about the circle of fifths and key families, like there's a key to the left and the key to the right that's related. Similar phenomenon here. The A minor doesn't jar us. It's not jarring at all. In fact, it's it's kind of a nice, pretty feeling the way it moves, right? So, uh, yeah, so uh, um, that, I mean, it's just a beautiful move. Now, the question, though, is, but he's coming for you. you and I had memories longer than the road that stretches out ahead well i'm coming i'm not doing b flat to a minor i'm doing g minor to a minor well that's still melodic minor number one that's g melodic minor and secondly the b flat is uh, the g minor is simply replacing b flat right g minor is b flat's little sister right contains two notes of the B flat chord, the root and the third, the really important notes of the B flat chord, to state it, that's what G minor has it in. And the only difference is in B flat there's an F and in G minor there's a G. So it's it's sounding like it. So let's listen to it again. Getting outside of that 
part of the, uh, I just want to say this kind of briefly, but this relative parallel switch I discovered, not only does it unpack a number of songs, like I'm really very proud of this, but secondly, uh, what was I going to say, secondly? Yeah, that's me annotating and then forgetting what I was going to get to. All right, never mind. I, 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 it'll come to me, I guess, but uh, sorry about that. Yes, we'll get back to it. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful move. And again, that sense of release when you come back to the initial key. Oh, that's what I wanted to say. See, it did come back to me. B flat is a major key and G is a major key. But B flat, if you look at the pentatonic scale, when you play the blues, I got a G note and a B flat note. That's a minor note compared to the key of G, G uh, to the G7 chord at B flat, right? The key of B flat is minor to the major key of G major. In other words, the major key B flat is becomes minor esque in relation to G. That's the beauty of what I discovered. This is to me is an amazing, amazing revelation. Uh, you know, I'm not pinning badges on myself because it came through me. It's not mine. But I, I think it's really important. But I, that's, I think it's really that is at the heart of what gives it that characteristic sound of the r triumphant release when you get back to the tonic, which is major. It's that right. Aeolian ascent, to use a right. fancy term, right? Th that right. It's like a Picardy third. It's like, hey, and here's a major. And so, yeah, that's what gives it that oomph. Right, right. Uh, the Aeolian ascent, like if I was in the key of G and the Aeolian ascent, would be going from the four to the five to the six chord of the key of B flat, not G. So this is just to get, forget all the theory, just listen to the sound of the Aeolian ascent. And you can hear that opening up at that last chord, right? I mean, it was used in corny ways and like uh, TV shows like to kind of joke. You know, Faux triumph. Uh, uh, I, I think of Super Mario Brothers, but you know, it's yeah. Oh yeah, that's in Super Mario. But it, it it's is. all over. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. it's it's so iconic. Like you feel yeah. that is a feeling in music. Like you you know what that is as soon as you, you know what that is. Billy Shears. Billy yeah. Yeah. Billy Shears. Right. Yep. Uh, and I think there they were using it jokingly, actually. Yeah, I think so. Like, here's Billy Shears, everybody. Whoa! Right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this reminds me a little bit about Lydian, the similar thing where Lydian could be super mysterious and, and dark and unusual, but it can all be, all, also be used comically, you know? So I can, you know, be in the key of G... sour little note but that's where you get and a whole bunch of other stuff you know it's funny like that you know like the the aeolian ascent is very very similar if you use it rightly it can be beautiful you know but if you use it kind of like bang someone over the head with it yeah it's gonna be that comical yeah you know so but anyway yeah, yeah. um yeah. It, yeah. So it, this is not a complicated song harmonically, then, is what you're saying. It is not a complicated song harmonically, but Paul did the right thing by adding that bridge in because it would have been boring if he stayed in G. Yep. You know? Agreed. He knew that. And he I think that. you're exactly right. It's the space, just that, doom, 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 and then into the next. It's definitely a modulation. You definitely hear it, but you can go with it because you've got that little space where you're waiting for it. Yeah, right. There's, he said, they set up anticipation for it. It's like, okay, w what's going to happen now? And then, boom, you get this chord. It's like, oh, cool. I'm in a different space now, you know. So, or if you're a music theorist, you're saying, I'm in the, <laughs> relative to G major, I'm in B flat major, which is minor to the key of G major, even though it's a major key. Yeah, like that. It's a curse, James. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, do we have anything else to say about the song harmonically or the out, the coda, I should say? I almost said outro. Uh-oh. Uh, 
I, I mentioned the mistake because I like picking up on those things. I just about the mistake. This seems like, OK, this really, you know, when you think about it, they're hailing back to the early Beatles when they did live recording in a studio. And it was kind of like that, because if you listen to early Beatles recording, there's plenty of mistakes you could pick out, you know. Uh, so it was almost on par with what was going on. But but on the negative side, I'd say this was standard Beatles laziness. They were they got really kind of schlumpy around this period and thought they were so great we could do anything. Dirty, Maggie May, nah, 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 you know, all this stuff, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, it was kind of like shrug. Okay, well, you know, it's there. Big deal. We'll just erase. Oh, the, I can hear a little piece. Ah, don't worry about it. Yeah, I guess so. Still, I'm not going to let that spoil my appreciation of this song. I like the song. It's a great song. It's a, it's a great song. I just wish that George Martin had produced this record all, all together. I probably would have loved you know, the record. You know, listen to that Produce Like a Pro th- uh, video that I'm going to send um, because they yeah. do talk that George Martin did have some uncredited work on a couple of the songs, including some work that you would think was Phil Spector being overboard was actually George Martin. I oh believe I'd let I, it be. I, yeah, the song. Are you, are you, oh my God, is, are you going to break my idol? Is that right? Well, I don't know. My... You, I, I, you go listen and see, see what you think. Uh, I can't, I can't remember exactly which songs and exactly what he did to them. So yeah, maybe mm-hmm. you'll approve. Yeah. I, I'm, you know what? I mean, I, I'd be curious what George Martin has to say about it too, had to say about it too, because he might have been in this mood of like uh freaking Beatles, man. You know, they're just jerking around. They get Phil Spector in here of all people, you know, and you know, the only, the thing that I, you know, I think they were really excited to have Phil Spector. I'm sure they were because he was an icon in early sixties, American pop music. So the Beatles had that love of American stuff, you know, all this. I so definitely the get the impression. Thing. It was more of a John thing, right? John liked Phil. I, I have a feeling. Paul. Yeah, I don't think Paul would. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And again, I think Paul was at this point of trying to appease John. I think John was getting a little difficult at this point, you know, in terms of his musical taste and what was good and what wasn't good. And being such a confused character to begin with, you know, like he'd believe one thing one minute and another the other, you know. Uh yeah, plus, Probably as I say, Magic Alex, and they had this studio built that was going to be super state-of-the-art, and nothing worked. <laughs> they had to basically yeah. start again. That's what I see around this period. You start to see these negative influence come into the Beatles' world. You see Alan Klein, Phil Spector, Magic Alex, who was obviously full of it. And probably there are plenty of others we haven't heard about, you know. Lewison um, has intimated in several interviews that the real story of Magic Alex is going to be a bit different, and it's not quite like people think. I don't know. I'm in, I'm interested to read it when it comes out in 2037 or whatever. Curious. Curious. <laughs> James, I have to tell you, I don't know if this happens often in Japan, but I could smell off the street the, the, the odor of marijuana smoke coming through my window right now. <laughs> Does not That's happen in Japan in that much, no. <laughs> I call pot Venice's local currency. Yeah, there you go. You can have some secondhand <laughs> fun there. Um, well, you know what the best part of Let It Be is? When it's over? Well, as I was going to it leads into Abbey Road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Which is their redemption, and you damn well know it was their redemption. I Actually, think even I, will, John... I will say one other thing in defense of Let It Be, the Let It Be project, the Get Back project, whatever. Billy Preston. He absolutely elevates the songs that he's on. I'm glad he was on them. Yeah, you do know the story of George Harrison and why uh, he was he was encouraging bringing other musicians in. Uh, I, I generally because he was unhappy uh, with the probably, working conditions. You probably know. Yeah, like uh, during uh, the White Album, there was a lot of skirmishes, uh, social skirmishes between them, to the point where George got so frustrated, and this was a really truly wise move on his part. He invited Eric Clapton into the sessions. Of course, you know, he did the famous guitar solo for While My Guitar Gently Weeps. And the reason he did it was because he knew John and Paul would behave in front of friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So and, uh, uh, apparently it worked to some extent. Yeah. Uh, they say when I, Billy came in, it, it certainly lifted their spirits. It lifted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, I didn't 
like Billy Preston being in on the Beatles, nor did I like Eric Clapton being in on the Beatles. I was a real purist. Like, it has to be the four of them. Really? I, I think, like, a song like One After 909 is a slight song at best. But with, with Billy on it, yeah, there's something there. Well, he, I can listen he's to. a great... Yeah, no, he's great. He's a great piano player, don't get me wrong. And he was great unto himself as a songwriter. He did some great stuff, you know. I just, I was... I don't know. I just... When Let It Be came out, I was so disappointed as a kid. I just felt like this is not what I was hoping for. Yeah, the worst part is that chronologically, in terms of release, it was the end. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. What a terrible note to end on. Oh, and speaking of which, um, you know, you get songs like The Long and Winding Road, things like this, where Paul is starting to write these lament songs, these goodbye to the Beatles songs. That also... W- caused me some dislike for let it be because it was a sign of the end of something really beautiful um but here's an interesting thing you know you and me uh chasing paper and all this stuff i always thought it was with him and john it was about him and john apparently it's not the story goes you read about this that um linda mccartney yeah they'd go for drives and she'd tell tell paul get lost let's get lost let's go somewhere and really get lost and paul's like i don't want to get lost and you didn't know try you're gonna love it yeah well not to psychologize too much but obviously it is about paul and john too yeah you know, I it's so. he's writing about linda but there's a bit of that in there clearly i think so i mean chasing paper for example i yeah. mean that's all about signing documents yeah exactly and, you know so there's a uh, yeah you're... there's a lot of I mean, whatever. He's an artist. He's taking everything. It's all in there. Psychologize away. Uh, it's like, yeah. uh, uh, oh, darling, is Paul singing to John? Not really, but yeah, probably, really. Y- yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I never considered that. Also, uh, by the way, the When you told me that be... you don't need me anymore, I nearly broke down and cried. Wow, yeah. Yeah, huh. Wow. That's intense. Yeah. Yeah. And that also, because another thing that was like a bolt of lightning when I read it was that John apparently said at some point, why don't you get me to sing that? I could sing this song so much. This is my wheelhouse. And he's right. John's voice would work very well with O'Darlin. With Paul, you can hear he is straining to get that song. But it was important for him to sing that song. And I think it's Yeah, was, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense then. Yeah, in fact, uh, there are some John Lennon off of solo career records that are kind of reminiscent of Oh Darling in that style, you mm-hmm. know. Um, That's a very 50s-esque yeah. song, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it, it has my least favorite chord progression of all time, which is uh, one, five, six, four. And by the way, I don't know if I let you know this, but I have a second progression that I hate, uh, which is six, four, five, one. <laughs> this one is another one that's everybody right. Can I can progress. I just ask some note of personal interest? How about six, one, five, four? That's interesting. Yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's Yay. okay, that's good. The, that was the first song I ever wrote, was 6154. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, my, my, my barometer for this is how many songs have used that progression, you know? When you, mm. when you get into the million mark with 1564, yeah. I'm like... <laughs> Please, you know, there was that parody video of those yeah, two of guys with yeah, 40 yeah. songs, you know. But I think like, O'Darlin uh, gets the pass because it was well before that became the cliche, yes. right? You know what, too, is uh, like the 1645, which is the, the 50s, you know. I remember as a kid, we talked about this, but it was a challenge to uh, me and my friends to write that progression, but not sound like 50s. And to write a decent melody over that is actually really hard. Um, and every once in a while, I'll hear my dreaded progression, but it won't pop out at me. I'll give the composers credit for that. If you can write that progression and I don't like start to cringe, 
that means you've done a good job with it, and I accept the progression. You have my wait. Which approval. is your most hated one? One six five four, one six five yeah. five. Yeah, one six five. Four. Yeah, which is let it be. By myself in time of trouble. Uh, speaking of which, one more thing. I know we know that the song "Let It Be" came to Paul in a dream, right? It was about his mom comforting him, right? What? And those supposedly were the words she spoke. But when I first heard the phrase "Let It Be," I thought it was an anagram of Beatles. It isn't. It isn't officially, but Let it's at <laughs> It, it isn't officially, but it's it's kind of close-ish. And I, I think Paul's unconscious was kind of at work there. Like, in other words, his mom comes to him and says, you know, let it be. It's okay. Comforting. But comforting over what exactly? Well, the band is breaking up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Could have been yeah. like an unconscious. Uh, yeah. I mean, that. I think that would be the obvious way to read that, especially when it's in 1970 and the band's broken up and let it be. I mean, how yeah, else could you yeah. read that song, right? Yeah. 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 Well, don't forget, though, I mean, when the song was written, it yeah. was still way before they yeah, broke up. Yeah, before that point. But was he sensing where things were going, blah, blah, blah. Again, we yeah. can psychologize. Have we started talking about Abbey Road now? <laughs> Maybe let's just go right into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what, James? I, ha I have to tell you, I'm a little scared of Abbey Road because mm. it's so huge. Yeah. I know. You know. I'm trying to think which song should we tackle. We, uh, for the record, have already talked about The End on one of my subscriber-exclusive videos. Um, right. Which, I that think was that's the only one we've done so far. Yeah, that's the only one we've done so far. Ever. Like, we never really got into... Uh... And I'm going to... Well, you always manage to surprise me. I won't say, but I have a feeling I know which one you're going to ask about. We'll check, because I already know. Um, Yeah, all right. Oh, well, I think okay. I know. Uh, so, anything else to say about Let It Be before we let it be? I don't think so. I mean, uh, I like I said, naked, I liked a lot better than uh, than clothed. I don't even have clothed at this point. I don't have yeah. a copy of it. So I should uh, I should do it just so that I know what it's actually, what the real album is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, like, when you talk about other producers stepping in, like, if she's leaving home off of Pepper's, it doesn't quite sound like a George Martin production to me, believe it or not. It's noticeably different. Well, Something about George. Yeah, someone else did the score for that, right? But did they actually sit there and produce it? I don't know. Oh, you know, uh, maybe I'm wrong about that, the, them actually producing, because they might have gotten a credit on the record for producing. Yeah, they might have had to legally get a credit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe it was scored, but it... In either case, I mean, it still doesn't sound like something George Martin would have chosen for some reason. I think he would have done something better, actually, than hey, the harp thing. It's not a bad song, but... Oh, it's a lovely song. It's, yeah, really wonderful. And it's so evocative of the times, you know. The kids were running away from home, and I was going to run away to California when I was 16. He's leaving home. Yeah. Oh, well, weird. I finally ran away to California. Just took a few years. Were you meeting a man from the motor trade? Uh, no, no. But, you know, I might have ended up in Hollywood Boulevard as a sex slave at some point, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there you go. Another edition of the Beatles uh, analysis. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Fun for yeah. the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I never mark this is for kids, so don't worry about it when I do the YouTube thing. <laughs> All right. All right, James, it's always a great pleasure and a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. <laughs>